The business situation framework is used for a wide variety of client situations or company situations. Everything from a, a new market, entry, a new product, starting a new business, opening a lemonade stand, uh, growth strategy, um, divestiture in some cases, um, strategy turnaround, how is the company doing in general. Okay? Um, it's just a good way to understand what issues are driving and impacting the business overall. And so let me walk you through what each of the pieces are. Um, and I'll actually draw it out like I would in a case. Um, oh, here's one. You might want to think about whether you, <laughs> this seems kind of silly, uh, when you have paper, depending on the framework you use, you actually want to practice whether you want to have that sort of vertical orientation, horizontal, depending on how much space you need, because it's sort of weird if you run out of space and you have to flip pages, you'll get confused. So yeah, sort of have a preference, but know it in advance. So in this case, I probably for this one, I would probably normally do it sort of landscape style. But I can't show it, so I'll do it this way. So what I usually do is, the, uh, let me just give you the demo of the opening a little bit, and then we'll talk about the actual framework. So uh, the, the, the way the case is usually presented is, um, uh, you work for a major airline company, and they are thinking of, this is a good one, they are, uh, now there's some capacity issues on that one. I was going to say, they, they're entering, they're thinking of starting like a, a low-cost airline provider, okay? But the problem with that is there's a fixed cost issue. Um, you are working with a, um, uh, okay, so you're working with uh, the National Basketball Association, and uh, they recently successfully completed a pilot program uh, showing NBA final games in, in, in China. Uh, and they had five times more viewers in China for those games than in the United States. Okay? NBA commissioner comes to you, you're working on that as a client. Um, should NBA enter the China market okay, and televise its games in China? And if so, how should they do it? Okay, that would be fairly typical of a case like that. Okay? And, and it's like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, there are probably four key areas we need to look at to understand whether the NBA should enter that market, and if so, how. Right? You certainly want to look at the customers, Look at the products that you're providing to that marketplace. You want to look at the company itself, the MBA. And I'm on uh, slide D here. And then you want to look at the competition. Uh, those are sort of the, the four key areas. Um, in this case, because it's entering a new market, um, and obviously these, all these issues are important, I, I probably would want to start with the customer first. And that's what I usually do. Um, you'll find in, in some of the uh, case prep books I've seen out there, they, they tend to, like for particular situations, skip the customer. Uh, and I just have a preference for always, I, I just feel a lot more comfortable knowing what's going on in the marketplace. And the customers have the money. If they're changing their minds, I want to know about it because that's implications for everything else. If it's an M&A situation, but customers want, customer needs have changed, it has implications for M&A, has implications for capacity. So I, I personally just like starting with the customer because all the businesses are driven off the customer. Okay? Not everyone does that. Lots of ways to be right. You can come back to it later, but I just have a preference for starting with a customer. That's what I usually do. Okay, so that's how I usually lay it out. And then depending on which branch I'm going through, I'll use these sort of standard opening questions. Uh, and again, the, the, the purpose of these questions is not to solve the case. It's very important. The purpose of these questions is to get you sort of baseline information to make this case interview feel more like an HBS case. So you have data, okay? Blank sheet of paper, hard to solve the case, hard to be a protagonist when you have no idea what's going on. When you have data, it's a lot easier. So the purpose of this is really to kind of get you through about a third to half the way through the case, okay? And then the rest is really sort of based on what you discover. So judgment, business acumen, sort of logical conclusions all sort of matter. Uh, some creativity tends to matter at sort of middle of the case. Um, up front, it tends to be sort of mechanical, okay? So I'm gonna go through the mechanical stuff uh, and show you the kind of questions I typically ask. Okay, so first question, um, I'll list all of them and I'll explain what each one means. So the, the, the series of questions I typically ask are who is the customer, what does each customer segment want, what is each segment willing to pay in terms of price, uh, what distribution channel does each have, and sort of what's the concentration of customers in that marketplace. So sort of quarters, five forces, but like a fifth of it, right? Um, so with customers, I always ask who is the customer, and what I'm looking for, I'm looking for segments. Okay? So I want to know customers overall, that's sort of very misleading. I want to know, you know, what are the segments? The important questions there are to, to, to figure out what the segments are, 
Okay. And usually, uh, I should be prepared for this, uh, when, when consultants do and market researchers do segmentations of customers, um, they tend to sort of like give them nicknames. Okay. Um, so it's like, actually this is what happened with the uh, minivan. Right? The minivan has this association for being with soccer moms, right? That's, I suspect it's because the, guy who, the person who did the original market research study says it tends to be like women with like one and a half kids who are age five that tend to be attracted to minivans. Let's call them soccer moms. Okay? And so that name stuck. Um, so they will have nicknames, and they're usually sort of amusing because otherwise it's kind of boring <laughs> um, to sort of work with them all day. And it's also easier to visualize who that customer is. Okay? Um, so the segments, uh, you want to know the segments how big they are, what share of the total demand comes from each segment, and then the growth rate of each. And all of this is like on that first bullet, if you would, or should be a bullet, but I guess it's missing a bullet. But that first line item on this framework sheet. Okay? So who are the customers? What are the segments? You want to understand them at a qualitative level. So who are these people, right? And then you want to understand it mathematically. So, for example, um, and I'll make stuff up, for, for China, it could be, uh, it turns out there are three major segments of, there were three major segments of viewers um, in, in China for the NBA games. Um, about 80% were men, 20% were women. Okay, that's useful, right? Uh, great, uh, and that's useful. And uh, within the men, do we have any more information on what kinds of men, maybe age demographic, you know, how old were they, younger, older? Uh, were they interested in sports? Was it a novelty thing? Or they would play basketball? Um, and the, the interviewer might say, well, that's a good question. Uh, amongst the men, 80% um, were under the age of 20. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it's, it's a youth market that's watching. Okay. Um, and amongst that, well, are these kids, are they, playing, are they playing basketball? Or was it sort of a novelty thing? Turns out 80% of the 80% actually play basketball. Uh, turns out, by the way, Michael Jordan is extraordinarily popular in China. My, my brother visited sort of rural China in the middle, and they called him Michael Jordan for like a week. And they have like no TV, dirt poor, but they all know who Mike is. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Um, and so you can start getting a flavor, right, for who this customer is. It's kids, in a lot of ways, like, like American kids. I'm, again, making all this up. And that gives you some sense of, okay, I understand the context of what's going on here. Uh, all right, next question is, um, what does each customer segment want? Okay, oftentimes, the needs are very different. Uh, and you may want to tackle the markets in a very different way. You might want to target one segment over another. You might want to ignore one. You might want to sort of attack both, but in a different way. Okay. So uh, using the, the whole China example, it could be that um, uh, you know, half, of them, half, the, half the viewers were, were like young kids, and half of them were like sort of adults. Well, that's interesting. Why are the adults watching? Why are the kids watching? What are they getting out of it? Uh, the kids are watching because they get to learn new moves, right? The adults are watching because, you know, um, they're, they're really into sports in general. So they're like the sports widows of China, sort of like Americans. Like, okay, that's interesting to know. You sort of get an idea of what's driving them, okay? Now, probably not appropriate for this case, but if it was more of a product purchase rather than a, than a media viewership, um, you know, what is the price each segment is willing to, willing to pay? Um, so in this case, if this was the China MBA thing, I might want to know who are the advertisers. Okay. Are these American companies or are these sort of you know, uh, local companies? Are they big companies or are they small companies? Why are they advertising? What's driving their need to advertise? So it might be that um, P&G China you know, has a really tough time reaching sort of the, the younger age market because the way me there's not as much media there. I have no idea. Um, and, and, so that's the, and companies like that are driving the bulk of advertising sales in the pilot program. Okay, that's useful to know. Okay. So this whole time we're doing is we're sort of just gathering information. Um, you don't want to, you, you want to sort of synthesize, sort of like do a little mini summary as you go. You don't want to just like gather information for like 40 minutes. Okay. You want to sort of refine what you're thinking, think out loud, okay. just like I was. So interesting, oh, so these are like, like, like sports kids who just want to be like Mike, but they want to be like Mike in Chinese. Okay, I got that. That's one group. And then there's sort of like the sports widow. Okay, I don't kind of know what that is. I'll make an analogy. Uh, and then I might say, well, it seems like so far my hypothesis is that the, the, the market breakout in China seems to be very similar so far to American viewership, as I understand it. Okay, that might be your hypothesis. And so far I'm favoring, and the, the, the underlying tone is, so far I'm favoring that this seems like a good fit so far. But we haven't looked at the other factors, but my hypothesis so far is that it looks like it might be a good thing to worth considering, well, at least testing further. 
Um, for uh, the other questions I usually ask are uh, distribution channel preferences for each segment. Um, so again, in China, the, they do a lot of like um, Avon lady stuff, you know? So person to person selling, which is like not so popular here anymore, but is really popular because it's more of a relationship culture. Um, so it, in every market, there's like always big biases in terms of how customers want to be served. Um, in certain um, technology markets, so like really expensive software packages, uh, fortune finders, CIOs, they tend to like to deal with one person. So they want to deal with one person from Sun, one person from HP, one person from, I don't know, Apple or whatever, uh, or IBM. And that may be different than how these companies are organized, right? So you may have an issue where uh, you're losing market share because the customer wants to deal with one person, but your company is organized by product line. So the CIO of Pepsi has to deal with five salespeople. And, and their complaint is, not one person from your company knows my entire system. Okay? And I find that unacceptable, and that's why I'm going with IBM. Okay, something like that. Okay. Uh, so by understanding the, the distribution channel preferences, uh, or actually that's probably a bad example for this particular point, uh, but maybe it's like I like working with my system integrated partners. So I want to buy my hardware, I want to buy my software through my Accenture consulting partner because that guy knows everything <laughs> and I trust him. I don't want to deal with IBM directly. I want, I want you to go through that guy. Okay? That's my preferred way of doing business. Um, for some younger segments, uh, I prefer to buy things on the internet. I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to see, talk to someone in person. Right? Uh, for certain kinds of things, I want to buy over like SMS right? or texting or whatever. Um, and I can see sort of on the internet, uh, a lot of younger kids want to buy through Facebook. Like they spend all their time in Facebook, that kind of thing. So there's preferences as to how they prefer to buy, how they want to access vendors, and it's useful to know that in advance, particularly by segment. So virtually everything here, you want to sort of break it out by segment whenever you can, especially customers. Uh, and then the final one is uh, customer concentration and power. And what we're looking for here is uh, what I call the Walmart effect. Is there one big customer, right, that P&G cannot afford to ignore? Okay? Do they have so much power that driving out all the profitability earlier in the value chain? So this is sort of from Porter's Five Forces. That's very useful enough because if that happens in an industry, it has implications for what you might want to do. Okay, you, you, you'd, you'd react differently if you knew that were to be the case. If you miss that fact that there's a Walmart customer out there, um, your recommendations could be off, okay? Because they're not, they don't work as well in that kind of situation. So those are sort of like the five questions I typically uh, ask. And usually by the time I get through the five, I got a good feel for what's going on on the demand side, okay? Again, you can add your own in there, I suggest you do, but sort of have your stock opening four or five questions in each category. Uh, that gets you sort of the information you need. And I found these five tend to work well for me. Yes, question. Question on this. Is there any obvious question that you might have to justify Blackberry? Why do you ask these questions? Yes. Um, so the question is, um, you always want to justify why you're asking for more information, and you want to sort of continue to justify each step. Actually, in, in a business situation context, you, you get a little more leeway. Okay? So in a clear profitability case, you want to be hypo it's very mathematical, right? So it's clear case, hypothesis, data, test, refine, and you keep going. Um, in this, there's, there's a lot of contextual information you need, so you can actually start asking, you, you get a little more leeway. You can go a couple questions without saying why you want it, um, but it's good once you sort of reach a sort of an interim conclusion to actually state that, because uh, then you're sort of synthesizing in little steps. Yes, question. When you are comparing, when you're analyzing the Chinese market, yes. Uh, actually, that's a good point. Should, uh, in that prior example, I sort of compared the Chinese market to the American market. I did make some assumptions. If I'm going to make it, I should state it. But I, it's actually better to ask, it seems to me, it seems like it's similar to the American market. Do we know if that's true or not? Okay? So that would be a, good, that's a better way of phrasing it. So you see, it's good because subtle word changes, right, make a difference in, how, in terms of how it's in, uh, interpreted. Um, so make no assumptions at all. And if you do state you're thinking about making one and see if they think it's a good idea, that sometimes they'll say, I don't think that's a good idea. When they tell you it's not a good idea, it's not a good idea for a variety of reasons. Either it's wrong or they're not prepared to talk about it or they have no data or it's sort of logically inconsistent because they made up the case and they want you to go somewhere else. Take the lead and go somewhere else. Okay? Yes? When you have uh, like the Walmart effect, mm -hmm. if you have one customer that's so big, is it almost always that you just focus all your effort on that, your recommendation on, around that? 
Um, my, my first instinct is when that's happening, the, the problem tends to be sort of um, the problem, uh, what do you do with Walmart and versus everyone else? So that's my initial reaction of how I would start segmenting my, my analysis and my, my, my approach because they got this one big elephant that the rules are really different for them. So the questions could be, okay, if I'm a small company and I got a Walmart type customer sort of down my demand chain, if you would, um, what do I do? They have 50% of the buying comes from that one customer, the remainder are the other 50%, and that's fragmented over 500 customers, or 1,000 or 500,000 customers. What should we do? Well, so we could look at each one separately. Let's first analyze the whole Walmart thing. Are we likely to win that game? But, so buy, you see a segment sort of customers, um, competitors for Walmart, competitors for everybody else. Products sold to Walmart, products sold to everybody else, right? Uh, what are our efforts as a company towards Walmart, towards everybody else? It's still the business situation framework, right? Same key issues, but when I know there's a Walmart type customer, I start splitting everything along that segment because it seems relevant. That's just my, my first impression, right? And so I, and in that situation, you might have a, uh, we should devote all resources to Walmart, okay? Um, or we already are devoting all resources to Walmart and we're getting crushed. Okay, and it could be that there's a capacity issue, which would be like a creative framework, as you realize, like, why are we being crushed? Okay? Um, and it turns out we, have, we don't have low-cost position. Well, if you don't have low-cost position and there's a, a structural issue with the market where in the demand chain there's one big customer, then you, it seems like you can't win that game. Okay? So let's look at our other options around the non-Walmart customers. Uh, where's our position there? Who else is in that market in terms of competitors? And again, same framework, but sort of, you just sort of split it. And you may find that with Walmart, it's a losing proposition. Uh, everyone else other than Walmart um, seems like you can win. And there's some segments in there. And that's how you sort of have that conversation. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is, um, is the product. Um, uh, let, me, let me back up for one second. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of general frameworks out there that, um, that are sort of similar to this, like three Cs, four Cs, whatever Cs. And what you'll find is they all tend to cover the same thing, but they tend to organize it a little differently. So I've broken out product just out of habit. You could very easily lump product in with company, for example. Uh, some companies, uh, some frameworks have cost as a separate category. So like the four C's is like, I think customer, company, cost, and competition. I tap into roll cost underneath company, because I think the cost is within a company. Um, and if it's, a, if it's an industry cost issue, I'll treat that separately inside of competition. So it's all fairly flexible, sort of more ways, a lot of ways to be right. Um, you sort of, it's good to pick the way you like and sort of stick to it so you sort of get process repetition and, and get used to it. Okay, so for, for product, uh, my, my sort of four or five key questions I typically ask is, uh, at, at purely a qualitative level, I just want to understand the product. Like, what does it do? Why do people buy it? Why is it useful? And, and sort of put on my customer hat and make sure I understand that. Okay? Um, because you will get some insights, particularly when you combine it with other information, as to, well, maybe if, if the product is, is very good at being fast, you know, it's faster than the other the competitive offerings, are there other segments that value fast? Okay. If you don't understand it qualitatively, it's hard to do that. Um, so that's the first thing I ask, is just really understand the product at a customer level. Uh, second thing I want to know is this kind of widget, is it like a commodity good like rice, or is it a differentiable good like a service? Okay. So you want to know, how much flexibility do I have in changing the product itself? Okay. So if I'm selling coffee beans, hard to change, okay? Uh, if I'm selling coffee at a Starbucks, a lot you can change, okay? So it's useful to know what kind of product you're dealing with. Um, usually you get like an actual product. Sometimes you get like a widget, right? Um, but either way, it's worth asking to what degree is there variation, differentiation amongst the products that are in the marketplace. Uh, next thing I usually ask um, are, I want to understand what the complementary goods so if I'm selling, if I'm selling uh, ketchup, I want to know what, what, what's happening to french fries, right, and vice versa, because uh, they tend to go together. And if my complement is, is that, that market's getting beat up, that has implications for me. So if all of a sudden the government decided that french fries will like kill you in a month, then I'm sure ketchup sales will fall. Okay? So you want to know that, because if you don't know that, sometimes you're solving, this, you're solving the ketchup industry problem, but the problem's in, in potatoes. Uh, and so you're going to miss the whole point, and your synthesis and your conclusion is going to be off. Uh, substitutes as well, again, this is from Porter Spy Forces. Um, are there other things people can use other than our product? So this is really sort of um, indirect competitors. 
right? So uh, maybe the substitute, I don't know, for ketchup is honey, mustard, I don't know. Um, the substitute for uh, traditional MBA could be a online MBA, right? And maybe that didn't exist before, right? So it really um, is useful to, uh, to get some sense of how vulnerable you, the, the company is to substitute products. Again, it changes your conclusion sometimes. Uh, I like knowing about the product lifestyle. Is this product on its last legs that we have to sort of retire it anyway? Or is it sort of in its infancy? Um, sometimes if it's sort of on its last legs, then you, you're more apt to sort of kill the product because you know you got to do it anyway soon. And so making an investment in something to replace it might make more sense. But if it's sort of on its early stages, maybe it's better to try to get it to, to fix the marketing in that business, for example, get it to work than to, to kill it because it takes it's like a long, it's like a long um, uh, cycle for developing new products. So like cars. Like to get a new car out the door, it's like four or five years or something like that. Um, so if you're in the first year and, and you want to say, well, there's a flaw in the product, well, you can't fix it. You can't fix the platform until like, you know, five years from now. Well, then let's not look at there because we need some, something better to, to, make, to make some improvements more, more immediately. Uh, and last thing, and this, this, this sort of depends on the nature of the product. Sometimes I'll ask packaging questions. Uh, what's included, what's not included? Sometimes you can differentiate the product by based on what's bundled in. So uh, it's like razors with razor blades. Um, uh, actually, uh, a couple years ago, it was like cell phones with service plans. So you drop the cell phone price to close to free, but you, you bundle in a mandatory service plan. And that really drove a lot of adoption. Right? Same product, same fit. Now, you didn't change manufacturing. Right? You just change the nature of the packaging, and that dramatically changed um, market penetration, adoption, and ultimately sales. Okay? If you didn't sort of think about that, you, that industry would have missed a very big opportunity. Okay? So you're seeing this as really sort of like a checklist. You know, I sort of think of it like you're trying to fly an airplane, standard questions you ask every single time, just to sort of cover your bases. And usually what happens is when you ask these questions, it flushes out useful information that will lead you in the right direction. Okay? So again, this is really the open, it's my, it's my standard opening. I sort of wake up in the middle of the night, and I have my five questions for customers, my five for products, and so on and so forth. And it's just to sort of get you in the right direction, get enough information to sort of use your analytical reasoning skills to kind of continue. So that's product. Uh, next up is sort of company or client. Um, and key questions there are, uh, what is the company good at? Okay. This is sort of like a squishy qualitative thing. Um, you want to know, what are the company's capabilities and expertise? And, and this is where uh, some, some interviewees, and actually some consultants too, this is where they kind of get screwed up. Um, because, you know, in, in, in like a, in a theoretical business case, the answers are very clean, okay? In a real world situation, it's not all about the hard data. In fact, a lot of it's the soft data, okay? Um, so one of the things you want to know with the company is what are they good at doing sort of as individuals at, and as an enterprise? Um, and, and the reason that's important is sometimes it will, you will have an opportunity where a client, where a market opportunity exists, there's a competitive vacuum, but the company is not good at what that market wants, that customer segment. So then theoretically, business plan wise, you know, maybe it's a good opportunity to pursue, but not necessarily for that particular company. So you have to know what they're good at. And I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. Uh, because we've asked customers what distribution channels they prefer, you want to know for your client or for the company, what distribution channels do you got? And what's the mix between them? So if there's a mismatch, this helps you flush out the mismatch. So if all the customers want channel A, but all your resources in channel B, that's a mismatch. Ah, okay, so that's an insight. And then you can start brainstorming about how you'd fix that. Understand why it's that way historically, uh, and then maybe make some changes along the way. Uh, okay, uh, cost structure. So this is sort of embedding a little bit of our earlier framework in here. Uh, the general questions are sort of, um, you know, are you the low cost producer or are you the high cost producer? Um, sometimes if you're dealing with a case that's just kind of conceptual, that's all you need to know. You need to know like the precise cost structure, like the number, but that, that we're the leading low cost producer in the market. Okay, and, and that's, that's good enough for this framework. If they give you information around, well, at this volume, we can produce at this cost, at a higher volume, you can produce at that cost. That's like a cost curve. That's more of a supply curve. And that's usually hint you've got to switch to, potentially switch to supply demand. Okay? So conceptual, you keep it here. Numerically specific, um, you switch to supply demand. Uh, other things with cost, um, a high, just these are sort of more notes rather than questions. Uh, 
the, the, understanding the proportion of fixed cost versus variable cost is very important because it in, indicates a barrier to entry issue. Okay? Uh, so an example um, I, I sort of I, I give from time to time is uh, Amazon early on when they first started the, the online bookstore it was a low it was a low fixed cost business totally virtual high margins um, they sort of had a website and then they had a drop shipping relationship with a number one wholesaler in books uh, Ingram books or whatever they are and uh, and Bezos in '98 did an interesting thing where he deliberately decided when even though the company was bleeding money decided to build out 300 million dollars worth of warehouses okay pissed off Wall Street to no end because you're gonna like make the margins like worse for like four years. It's like damn straight I am. Here's why. Um, number one, I don't want to be tied to my one supplier. Okay, so there's like an industry concentration issue, right? So it's what it's, it's the reverse of the Walmart effect. It's the Intel effect, right? I gotta buy all my chips from Intel, so they're getting all the profits and they're sucking it out of all like you know Dell and HP and Compaq and whatnot. Um, actually, I need a favor. What did I just say? I, I lost my train of thought. Very entry, okay. Um, so when the, when the fixed costs are, are very high, that indicates a barrier to entry, so you have to deal with what existing competitors are. If the barrier to entry is low, then you're gonna get new entries. That's what happened with Amazon. So there are like 1,001 bookstores that within the year, okay? So he said, well, screw you. I, went, I did an IPO, I raised a billion dollars. Boom, $300 million in chips on the table. You wanna come play with me? Put in 300 million bucks, okay? Um, and it, and it kind of was pretty effective, right? Uh, and then, so uh, Amazon in particular has been very good at sort of adding um, barriers to entry. So they went from physical warehousing infrastructure was sort of one barrier to entry, entry, so they raised the fixed cost for that business to be much higher, made it much more difficult to compete. Uh, and then they did a lot of other things on the variable cost side with book reviews, scanning, uh, scanning, uh, so like scan, they now scan a lot of the books. So you can kind of keyword search them. They probably have a couple hundred thousand books sort of scanned. So if you want to compete with Amazon, you got to go out and scan a hundred thousand books. Another big fixed cost. So they're just adding it up. So you want to go play ball with Amazon, you need like a half a billion to a billion. Big pain in the butt. No one does it. So they got the business to themselves. Um, okay, so that's why that's important. Um, uh, another thing you want to do is you want to compare the cost structure of the company to, again, to the marketplace. So this crosses over a little bit. And you just want to understand are we in line, higher or lower? And sometimes there's an insight there. And again, all this is just trying to flush out an interesting insight that sort of puts together or paints a picture of what's going on and how you can, what, what options you have for trying to fix the situation. Uh, if there's sort of, a, if the, the case is sort of investment oriented, we would want to include investment cost. Uh, intangibles are useful, it's sort of like a brand effect. You know, there's sort of a, a strong emotional loyalty customers have to the product that would um, be hard to combat sort of analytically, right? So analytically, it ought to work but customers just really love, I don't know, Aunt Jemima, like maple syrup, and then they just refuse to use anything else because it would be like heresy in the South. I have no idea. Um, financial situation, and then organizational structure. I talked about, uh, the example I give here is, you know, if you're organizing your company by product line, but customers want to be served sort of, a, sort of across product lines, so one point of contact, are you out of sync with what the market wants? So if you, if you ask the, um, uh, so in the customer portion of the framework, you're asking how do they want to be served, what the distribution channels are, what do they want. If that's an issue, they'll, they will typically mention it. So when you come back to the company, you want to ask what the organizational structures are, are you in sync with the marketplace? If you're out of sync, okay, that's an insight. What do we do about it? That's where the conversation sort of begins. Uh, okay, uh, last one is uh, around competition. Um, uh, I, I usually ask around, uh, I start with market shares. So who are the competitors and what the, what's the market share mix? How concentrated is it? Is it a monopoly, oligopoly, or is it highly competitive? Um, because the competitive dynamics are vastly different in those situations. Okay. Oh, funny story. Um, McKinsey, we were actually banned from talking about um, pricing in the context of price fixing. Uh, we had, literally had antitrust attorneys because we were, worked with like, the Fortune 400. So, you know, and oftentimes we work with all the key companies in an industry. And if profit sucks in one business, you know, it would have been very easy to say, nudge, nudge, wink, wink over lunch. You tell your CEO, I'll tell my CEO, we should all, all bump prices 10%. Um, that was like highly illegal. So it just sort of came to mind. Um, so you can't talk about that. And actually, I actually got reprimanded for talking about it um, because we were, we were really uptight about that. Uh, so, but knowing the concentration helps you understand uh, the competitive dynamics is very different. Um, uh, Porter's Five Forces, again, I've sort of incorporated elements of Porter's Five Forces in here. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth sort of reading competitive strategy of the book or even just Googling it and getting a summary of it. Uh, very useful. Uh, I, I mean, I was sort of, it's very insightful framework. Uh, I was sort of very impressed with it. I've sort of used it a lot. 
Um, let's see, uh, competitive behaviors. Uh, what are the competitors doing? What are, what, so basically, think of all the company questions you asked, and you want to know for the competitors. Same deal. Okay. Uh, best practices, uh, do they really excel at something that we stink at? Useful to know. Um, again, barriers to entry for the industry overall we talked about. And, uh, and supplier concentration, so the Intel effect. Do you got one supplier that kind of controls it? Are they sucking it? I always think of it as the Porter's five forces is do you got the what, suppliers, the company, uh, the com competitors, and then the, the customers. And it's like this one big vacuum and they sort of like suck profits out. They suck it out of the demand chain, they suck it out of the supply chain. And it's useful to know that if you, if you have that, that pressure on your business, it's useful to know that. And the last one, just to be complete, or completer, or more complete rather, uh, industry regulatory environment and like life cycle of the industry. So are we sort of in a, in a trough? Is it a cyclical business? So like in mortgages, I worked in, in finance for a number of years. Um, right now we're sort of in a, in a credit crunch thing and it's highly predictable. It goes back 50 years. Every 10 years this happens. You know, banks do, do stupid things, ask for a bailout, which is crazy. And then you know, people borrow more than they should. Market tanks because they're all bleeding. They got to write off loans and then there's no credit. And then they kind of come, comes back like seven years later. Um, Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the checklist I use. Uh, you had some, a couple questions, yes? Um, so about how long do we spend on Maris, like mm -hmm. 10 minutes? Um, uh, you, 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 when you start, you try to figure out where the, the, the issue is likely to be given what information you have, okay? Uh, if you don't know, so it would- gather all of it. No, I wouldn't gather, I wouldn't do what, what I just did, I would not do what I just did in the real case, okay? Um, yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> I, I'm just sort of explaining it. It does. It would be very boring. Um, what you want, what you want to do is, um, st I typically start with customer first, unless I, know, unless I have information that suggests it's like a competitive issue, and then I might start with competition. Okay. So you sort of figure out what information you have initially before you even touch the framework, and use that as your starting point. Um, and I tend to go on each of these. I might spend five to ten minutes, but usually what happens is, I, I almost never get through the whole thing before I discover something really interesting that's very indicative of what's going on, what's driving the problem. And at that point, this is where the creativity comes in. Okay? See, if you're mechanically good at this, you'll do what I just did, just bang, bang, I gotta ask these 40 questions. And, and, and the interview will drop useful information that if you're paying attention is insightful, but if you're mechanically going through it and you miss it, it's clear you're just kind of cramming through a, a framework. Okay? And that's like not good. Because okay? it doesn't show your problem solving, you're sort of you know, regurgitating stuff. Um, so what you're, look, what you're looking for is you're looking for an opportunity to branch off from this. Okay? So you're looking for the critical insight in each piece and that tells you what's going on, tells you, starts telling you the story of what's going on, and then you might sort of go ahead and sort of skip certain things. Right? So if the nature of the business is such that uh, it's sort of clear there's not like a Walmart effect or an Intel effect, I wouldn't use Porter's Five Forces. Right? Once I understand the nature of the, who the customers are, who the competitors are, I, I would sort of skip some of those things. So you start tailoring these things based on the information you get. And, and that's where, I don't know, call out minute 15 to minute 20, um, you start deviating from the framework a little bit. Or you start breaking things out, doing things within the framework so it's still organized, but it's not part of like the standard questions. Okay? So this is where the, the whole you know, talent comes in. It's less mechanical. It's more about looking at the situation and analyzing it. So you've laid out, you told them, like, I want to talk about yeah. customer product company yeah. competition. And you got an insight on customer, which is where you yes. started. Do you dig deep then, or do you go ahead and still get a broad picture before you die? It depends on, that's sort of actually more of a judgment question. Okay. Like, if, if I sort of got the aha, uh, I'll, I'll keep moving. If that's intriguing, unexpected, <laughs> counterintuitive, I don't understand why it's happening, I'll keep digging. Okay. Um, sometimes there's underlying, there's like underlying trends as to why things happen. So it's important to understand not just what's happening, but why. Okay, so th this sort of gets, the framework gets you to what, right? And as you get dr drilled down lower and lower, you start getting to why. And once you know why, then it's a lot easier to know what to do about it. Okay. Uh, and then that sort of becomes more like the HBS cases. You got all the information, you know what's driving the whole situation, now what are you as a protagonist to do? Okay. Um, and so that's sort of how that, process tends to, uh, tends to evolve.